The only real hope and change you'll ever get is from God. It's going to come from the Lord or it's not going to come at all. It's going to come when you admit that you can't do it and that you've got to have His help. Open your Bible to John chapter number 19 and we're going to read verse 16 through verse number 18. Then delivered He him therefore unto them to be crucified and they took Jesus and led him away and he bearing his cross went forth into a place called the place of a skull which is called in Hebrew Golgotha where they crucified him and two other with him on either side one and underline this in your Bible and Jesus in the midst what a verse of scripture four Gospels in your Bible, and they're different. John is different than Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Matthew traces the genealogy of the Lord Jesus Christ through his Jewish line all the way back to Abraham. Mark shows him as Jehovah's servant. Luke comes along and traces his human genealogy back to Adam. But John, that was written many years after Matthew, Mark, and Luke traces Jesus all the way back before Genesis 1-1. He says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God. He said in verse 14, and the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. So he takes the Lord Jesus Christ and traces him all the way back before Eden. Traces him all the way back before Adam ever took his first breath. Chases him all the way back to where God the Father said, Let us make man in our image. Amen. John, man, I'm telling you, he's always, he, he wrote five books in the New Testament the Gospel of John, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, and Revelation. And he identifies himself in the Gospel of John five times. And every time he identifies himself, he does it in this manner. He refers to himself as the disciple whom Jesus love. Isn't that something? What we're reading this morning is an eyewitness account. This is something that John himself saw. If you remember, John was at the foot of the cross. And it is the dividing line this morning. The dividing line of all humanity was on top of that hill, hanging on the middle cross. By that I mean this. Every person on the face of, the face of God's earth that's ever drew a breath of air, you will answer somehow one day to the man hanging on that middle cross. There is no skirting the issue. You will do business with the man hanging on that middle cross. It is the dividing line. You have a foreshadow of John chapter 19 and Exodus chapter 12 when the Lord told Moses to get the Passover lamb. He said, you take a male of the first year, take it on the 10th day, keep it up to the 14th day, and in the evening of the 14th day, you kill it. And if you go back and look, when you get home in, in Exodus chapter number 12, when it talks about the Passover lamb, every bit of that points 1,500 years into the future to John chapter number 19, the Passover of God. When Moses is talking about it, he uses this terminology in verse 3 of Exodus 12. He said, take a lamb. Now watch the cross reference in the New Testament right back to the Lord Jesus Christ. 1 Peter chapter number 1 and verse 19 calls him a lamb. I mean, it all goes back to the Lord Jesus. In verse number 4, he's called the lamb. The lamb in Exodus chapter number 12. John standing on the bank of Jordan ready to baptize, and he sees Jesus, and he says, hold it a minute. Behold, the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. And then finally in Exodus chapter number 12, he's called your Lamb. Amen? That means that it's got to be more to you than just a Lamb. And the Lamb, you have to identify with that Lamb. You have to deal with that Lamb personally. Not your brother or your sister or your mama or your daddy. You have to make your count, the Bible said in verse 4, for that lamb. And in 1 Corinthians 5, 7, Paul said, 
Christ is crucified for our, our Passover. Our Passover lamb that matches Exodus chapter number 12 I just read to you. In John chapter number 19. Exodus chapter number 12, you've got the first Passover lamb. John chapter number 19, you've got the last one. Amen. There's no need to go out and sacrifice a lamb for your sin anymore. That sacrifice has already been completed. My, my, my. I want to look at a few things. I'm going to deal with a few questions that I've had down through the years. I want you first to look at the location of Calvary. Look at the location where he was crucified. He wasn't on a back road somewhere up in Union County. No, no. He was in the center stage of the earth. The Lord said in, in Ezekiel 5, 5, Thus saith the Lord God. There's the authority. This is Jerusalem. I have set it in the midst, huh? In the midst of the nations and countries that are about her. Look at the location that everybody's going to answer to. He was on center stage in Jerusalem, the head of all nations. My, my, my. The Lord said, I've set Jerusalem in the midst of the nations. So center stage, center cross. You'll deal with it. Amen. It wasn't some obscure location. My, 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 what a thing. Now here's some things that I've heard down through the years and I would, I would uh, witness to the men that I worked with, talk to them over a CB radio and, and, and try to point them toward the cross. Now, I was a preacher, they expected me to do that. But here's the kind of feedback I got. When I would tell them, you will make your count for that cross. I don't care who you are. Everybody under the sound of my voice well, preacher, I, you know, I'm just here by accident. I, oh, no, no, no. It doesn't work that way. No, no, no. He sacrificed the lamb on center stage, middle cross. You will deal with it. You'll deal with it now or you'll face him one day as a consuming fire. There is no middle ground. Man, I try to get that cross to some of the drivers I worked with. And one of them said this. He said, there's just, I can't find enough historical evidence. What I wanted to say is don't sleep on the side of your head tonight. Your brain will ooze out your ear. You have to understand something. We're Bible believers. I don't need any more evidence. This is God's Word. That's good enough for me. Well, how do you, you explain what I feel in my heart this morning? I don't need any more. But a lost and dying world will try everything in this world to skirt the issue. He said there's just not enough historical evidence. And I said, really? I said, have you done any homework on that? The Roman historian, Tatius, who was a heathen, by the way, was forced to record that Calvary was a reality. He was forced to record it because there was too much evidence for him not to. He recorded that a man named Jesus of Nazareth was crucified. And he got it right. <laughs> not inside the gate, outside the northern walls of Jerusalem. Yeah. So I throw that little piece of evidence at him. And I said, also it's recorded in Jewish history by Josephus. He recorded the truth of a man named Jesus. Woo! Not like we need that. I'm trying to help a non-believer here that's trying to go around that cross. No, no, no. You're going to hit it head on. And you will deal with it. Nowhere to hide. No detours. you got to deal with it. I said, there's over 130, if you want to do your homework, secular historians. Most of them were God-denying infidels. But they was forced by the evidence to record in the annals of history that a man named Jesus. <laughs> man, I could have saved them a lot of time. I could have saved them a lot of research right there. I said, over 130 secular historians recorded those events. And I knew that would just lead to something else. He said, well, there's just not enough science. I said, say that again. Now, we dealt with the history part. I said, listen, you can't skirt the issue. There's nowhere to run. There's nowhere to hide. Center stage, middle cross. You'll deal with him. You will make your count. That word count also means estimate. Same word. 
you will have to give your estimation of what you think that cross is worth. Oh, yeah, buddy. Oh, yeah. Brother Rick, they try to go to another channel, and I say, you stay right where you're at. Company channels, channel 11. Don't jump up there to 19. We're still talking. He said there's just not enough science. Brother, I mean, you know, I, if science could show me something, science for the church. Now, I don't, I don't, I don't suggest you read this, okay? Science for the church. 328-23. New scientific evidence supports. Isn't that something? New scientific evidence. I don't need science. I've got the book. New scientific evidence supports the truth that a man named Jesus died on a cross outside the northern gate in Jerusalem. They say somewhere between 31 and 33 AD. I said, how hey, you like them apples? I heard you some science to chew on. I said, not only that, but the geologist. I said, he, he was a guy that wanted to study. I, want, I mean, you want to dissect everything. We may not get to have this close one-on-one -on -one talk anymore going down the road. And if I don't see you again, I want to give you everything that God wants me to give you. I said, you want evidence. Bible's good enough for me. Thus saith the Lord. You want historical evidence? It's there. You want scientific evidence? Oh, it's there. I mean, it's there. I mean, you can't, there, there's nothing you can do to get around it. But you know how they do. They just keep going on and on and on and on and on and on. I said the geologist on their seismic graphs where they study earthquakes, they have it listed that an earthquake took. Understand, I don't need this. And most of you all don't need this. But there's people listening that thought they would just maybe tune in and hear a sweet little message. But what's happened is you've been brought face to face with a cross on center stage in the center of the nation. Man, and you will deal with it. You will make your count for that cross. You will give your estimation of the worth of that cross. No place to hide, man. There's no rock, no mountain. There's no hole in the ground. You will give an account. They recorded an earthquake to, uh, it, was, it was, they called it a medium sized earthquake, but strong enough to do some damage on the western retaining wall of the temple. I said, are you got it, pal? Are you got it? I give you historical truth. I give you scientific truth. I said, you need anything else? And he said, well, I'm, I'm still not totally convinced. I said, the Bible was written for people like you. I could call his name right now. I'm not going to. Because the last time I talked to him, he still lost his goose and horse race. Last time I talked to him, he has not made his count for the lamb. And so he'll meet him head on as a consuming fire. Man, that's your choice. I know my choice. Man, I want to meet him on that middle cross as my savior. Amen. As the lowly Galilean. I don't want to try to skirt the issue and meet him in hell one day as a consuming fire. That's your choices. That cross is the dividing line. He said, well, I don't know. I said, well, nature teaches it. Amen. Psalms 19 said, the heavens declare his handiwork. The firmament shows forth. I said, you know, the Bible said in Psalms 19 that day unto day utter a speech. He said, what's that mean? I said, every morning when the sun comes up in the east, I said, when they entered, he didn't know nothing about this stuff. I said, when the priest entered the tabernacle to sprinkle the blood on the mercy seat, he entered from the east to the west. I said, that sun comes up every morning in the east, and then it dies, and that sun turns blood red in the west. The job's finished, blood's been sprinkled. And then you think he's gone. You think that sun ain't never coming back. But the next morning he arises again with healing in his wings. I said, listen, you've got the whole host of heaven that's condemning you. Night under night, they utter speech. They preach the gospel every day. Then he, then he, you know, then he, I gave him Romans 1 20 where Paul said, you deal with all this? Let me, let me help you. He said, you're without excuse. Man, he was running out of stuff. 
I want to call his name, but I'm not going to. He may be dead and in hell right now while I'm preaching. I don't know. He said, I, I just don't have enough evidence myself, preacher. I, I don't go to church. And he said, I don't know nothing about religion. And I said, well, you're, you're one of the ones that's easier to reach. It's hard to reach people that's got a head full of religion. Amen. And he said, uh, I, I don't go to church, so I just don't, I don't hear the gospel preached. And I said, you see it every day. I said, the sun and even the moon testifies that he's here. I said, every, I said there's, a, there's a church on almost every corner in America. And not, not all of them are preaching the truth, but there's a church on almost every corner of America. Do you know that the preaching of the Word of God goes out seven days a week, 365 days a year, 24 hours a day? It goes out over the broadcast and the Internet. Where are you going to hide? You say, I, I, I just don't know enough about it. And maybe somebody's here this morning. You say, well, I don't know. Sure, it's still out, preacher. I don't know about that. Well, that cell phone that we're all addicted to, that, that we don't want to be caught without it, may miss a call. What if somebody posts something on Facebook? I'm going to be the first to see it. God help us, man. I mean, if we've attached to our Bible as we were cell phones. But if you looked at that cell phone before you brought it in, <laughs> the very calendar that you make your schedule on testifies to the fact that the Lord Jesus Christ, bless your heart, is alive, amen. You can't escape it. You run anywhere you want to run. You're not going to get away from it. Not going to happen. Man, you get them down, you take away all their excuses, and there they are. It's just them and the man hanging on a center cross that shed his blood to keep them out of hell. Let me let you in on something that my daddy done. I got married when I was 20, and we was at my mom and dad's one time. And uh, I kind of smarted off to her. Yeah, I let her know who wore pants. My dad was sitting there, and it kind of, it made her cry. And, uh, but she took it personally, and it, it, it hurt her. She got up, and she went in the back room. And uh, my mama went back there to console her. He said, can I see you back in my study for a minute? I said, sure, dad. And I walked back there, and my dad shut that door, and he took his belt, and I thought, you've got to be kidding me. <laughs> you've got to be kidding this, me. This, this is not getting ready to happen. And, man, I heard that thing just like a kid, you know, that sound of it coming through every loop. <laughs> my dad grabbed the end of it. He said, you can bend over, I'll give it to you standing up. I'm 21, man. I, I'll lose my man card if my homies find out my daddy beat me with a belt. My daddy took that belt, buddy, and I mean he beat my rear end with it. And he said, don't you ever raise your voice to that little girl and make her cry again. Ever! Later on, you know, and everything got back, you know, Shannon said, why was all that commotion going on in the study? And I said, we were just discussing some scripture. <laughs> but after that, she would do this every time i do something. It upset her. You know what she'd do? That's four cell phones. Hey, um, he's, you need to talk to him. He's raising his voice. And I'm sitting there going, don't do that. And he would always take her side. Always. My, how we need to get back to that. Uh, don't get me going on that. That's the reason this country's in the shape it's in. Amen. That's not even my notes. Uh, there, there's, there's, there's no excuse. In 1979, they discovered a protein molecule that's inside the human body that intersects with another protein molecule. And when it intersects, it forms a cross. It's called a laminin, if you want to look it up. And they discovered that that protein molecule that's in your body right now is what literally holds the human body together. Hey man, talk that one. Well, you're going to hide about, you want some time? You want some medical science? Let me drop that little bomb on you. I've seen what laminin looks like under a microscope. You know what it looks like? It looks like a cross. It's what causes one cell to adhere to the other cell. Wow. You say, well, is, is that, uh, you think that's true, preacher? Well, I don't follow USA Today. But they reported April the 30th, 2021. They reported in USA Today. Well, I guess the glue 
that holds the human body together is shaped like a cross. Amen. You want me to give you my estimation of the man hanging on the middle cross? He's my everything. He literally holds me together. Not just physically, but spiritually and emotionally. You're carrying the cross around in your body. You know why the Lord worked it out that way? He worked it out that way to let you know there's nowhere you can go. There's no place you can hide. There's no excuse you can come up with. You will do business with the man on that metal cross. It's a dividing line between heaven and hell. My metal cross, center stage, no excuses. You got to make you count for it. I'll give you this and then, and then give an invitation. We'll go to the house. Finally, he said, well, Barry, he said, I don't even want to think about that stuff now. He said, but when I get ready to die, his words were, after I've sown all of my wild seed and got all the partying out of my system. And let me tell you something. In Luke chapter 15, that prodigal came home. I've preached, Brother Sam, the funeral of many prodigals that didn't come back home. Not all of them come back home. He said, when I come down to my deathbed, and I've lived all of my life and I've worn myself out. He said, don't they have this thing where you can call for a preacher or a priest and then perform the last rites? I said, oh yeah, they have that. And I said, it's totally, completely, 100% useless. There is no salvation without conviction. You don't just one day say, well, pretty day this morning, I think I'll get saved. No, you can't open the door unless somebody's knocking. You cannot come to him, he said, except the Father which sent me draw you. What's that feel like? Oh, when he starts drawing you, you won't have to turn to somebody and say, what is this? Oh, it's called Holy Ghost Conviction. When he shakes your soul out over hell, buddy, I'm telling you, and you come face to face, last rites. I tell them, bring a gun smoke in. Let me watch the last episode before I croak. Do me just as good. But that's what he's saying. I'm going to tell you something. I'm going to close with this. I had a friend. I don't know if he's here. He called me. He knows the situation personally. They want to bank on a meeting a man on the middle cross when they get ready to die and all the living's done and all the partying's over. We had a man that came to the church. He worked with a man in the church that got such a tremendous burden for him. The man, he prayed for him. He gave him tapes. He'd come to the church and listen to me. I liked him. He had such a such a, a, a sweet disposition, but he was a very wicked, very vile, very corrupt man. And I'd preach, and I, I'd try not to look at him, but I couldn't help it because we would be forewarned when he was going to be there for that Sunday. And the whole church, we'd have a church-wide altar prayer. He had no idea. The man I'd preach, I'd ask God to break my heart. I'd ask him to fill me with compassion. And I'd watch him back there. And the tears would just be flowing, pouring out of his face. But before the invitation was over, he'd always get up and walk outside. You, you ever done that? You sat there and you think, oh, God, I got if I can just get outside. Whew. Oh, man, Lord's on my trail. And once you get out the back door, <sighs> well, I survived that one. But he would wait for me. He wouldn't get in his car and leave. He'd wait for me. He'd wait till I come out. And he'd say, he'd call me brother. He said, Brother Barry, you're my favorite preacher. He said, I'm praying for you. And every time he'd come, man, we would be pre-warned that he was going to be there on that given Sunday. And the whole church would come to the altar. And they'd pray. And they'd call out his name. And finally, I, I watched him walk out one Sunday. Years went on. I ended up leaving Union Chapel. Took another church down around Harriman. And we kind of lost contact. Now, my friend that was going to be here this morning, I would call him and check on him. How's he doing? Any change? And it, it never was a real good report. I've been in the ministry since 1978. I've been with a lot of people on their day. I've been with God's people. Oh, it's such a difference, man. I've been with God's people just before they crossed over. And I've heard them say, look at them flowers, Brother Perry. You say, you're crazy. I might be, but I know where I'm going. And I know this. I've made my count for the lamb. I know that. You say, well, it's the medicine. Oh, yeah, you wait to precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. I got, I got a phone call when I was pastoring somewhere else. And this lady said, 
is this preacher McDonald? And I said, yes, ma'am. And she said, you don't know me. She know my daddy. And I said, who's your daddy? And she told me. And I said, oh, yeah. Yeah, I know him. I sure do. Well, daddy wants to see you. Said he's in a little one-bedroom apartment out here in Powell. And he's dying, preacher. He's dying. And he wanted us to try to get hold of you to come and see him. I, I remember it like it was yesterday, getting in my car and driving out there, thinking the last time this happened, it didn't turn out good. And I prayed all the way there. I said, Lord, please go in front of me. Oh, convicting Holy Ghost, please get there before I do. Oh, please do a work in his heart. He's about to check out, and he's about to meet the man on that middle cross. And unless he does business with him real soon, he'll go to hell and burn for eternity. Man, I remember like it was I walked in that little one-bedroom apartment out there in my apartment, Powell High School, where I graduated. I walked in there, and here was, here was I think, if memory serves me correctly, two daughters sitting there on the couch, holding on to each other, wiping tears. I didn't know what I was going to, I didn't know what I was going to walk into. And I, I, I knew them two girls was crying. I hope they was praying. That was their daddy laying in there. And I walked in there, and he was laying in the bed. And as soon as I walked in, he started to weep. He started to cry. One of the daughters said he's been listening to your preaching tapes for a long time. That somebody sent him from Union Chapel. Said he wants us to put him in before he even got sick, preacher. He's listening to some of them old preaching tapes. When I walked in, he looked at me. Man... His face just came apart at the seams. You know what he said to me? He said, Brother Barry, it's not right. That's what he said to me. He said, it's not right. I, I wasn't sure what he was talking about. I mean, was he saying it's not right that I'm going to die, that, that, that I'm here? That's not what he meant. I called him by his name and I said, I don't understand. He said, I want to get saved. But he said, it ain't fair. Why would he want me now? He said, I don't have time to do anything. I wouldn't have time to tell anybody. I wouldn't have time to go to my drinking buddies and tell them. I don't have time to go to church. I don't have time to be baptized. It's not fair. I want him, but surely he don't want me. I have nothing to offer him now. And I said, there was a thief hanging beside a man on a middle cross on center stage a career criminal dying justly for his sin he turned and looked at the man on the middle cross and he said Lord would you remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom I said the Lord Jesus looked at him and said today is that fast is that quick enough for you today shalt thou be with me in paradise I said, he didn't have time to give a testimony. He didn't have time to hand out one gospel track. He didn't have time to be baptized or to join a church. But he spoke to the man on the middle cross. And he looked up and now he's weeping. He's crying, the bed's shaking. And he said, why? I said, he's called on conditional love. It's love with no strings attached. I said, that's why John 3.16 says, For God so loved. He said, I think I, I know, but will you, will you tell me one more time what I need to... I'm telling you, man, Holy Ghost conviction was so strong in that little bedroom, it was hard to breathe. Man, I knew I didn't have to run him down the Roman road, man, and spend 15 or 20 minutes with him. I said, Romans 10.13, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord. He said, will he hear a dirty, rotten, filthy sinner like me? He said, I was a horrible husband. I've been a horrible father. I've done so many bad things. Would he hear from somebody like me? I said, he's called the friend of sinners. I said, he looks at you through a set of different eyes that man don't have. And I said, if you'll ask him, you write your name down in glory. Man, I wish I could have recorded the prayer of that old sinner. He said, Jesus, don't really know how to talk to you, but I'm filthy, I'm vile, I'm wretched, I deserve to go to... I'm, I'm listening, I'm thinking, ooh boy, he's about to get in right here. 
Man, he's just about to get in. Started telling the Lord what a filthy, low-life, no-count sinner he was. And he said, it's not fair. You're not getting nothing. But I believe you died for me. <laughs> and I want to ask you to come into my heart. Woo! He couldn't even finish the rest of his prayer. No, why? The Holy One moved in and put his stamp of approval on it. Man, I was sideways. That daughter sitting on the, she was turning furniture over. A squalling going on, run out in the living room. Them two sitting on the couch. Man, he's a squalling, knocking uh, uh, pictures off the wall. And I sat on the side of his bed and he reached up. Man, he, he was a man's man, buddy. I hate, I'm glad I never had to fight him. But he reached up and he grabbed me the back of my head and he pulled me right. Didn't have a shirt on. He's on his deathbed. I mean a big old bushy chest, man, out like that. I'm, it's the truth. I'm not making this stuff up. Man, and he grabbed me and buried me right in his chest. What'd you do? I shouted with him. Amen. We praise the Lord. <sighs> he said, did I, he said, did I do it right? I said, don't that feeling in your soul right now answer that? He said, it does, preacher. He said, I feel clean. I ain't never felt clean in my life. He said, I want you to preach my funeral. They won't believe a word of it. But I want you to tell my cronies that I got saved. You tell them I'm not going to hell. You know why? He done business. Notice also in the last days perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves. Covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers. It takes the grace of God to change us, folks. How can you be saved if you're not willing to repent? And the Lord Jesus Christ said, except you repent, you shall all likewise perish.